కోసం కూడా క్యాబినెట్ కు Education Global Forum. Before we get started, I'd just like to point out a few features of Microsoft Office Live Meeting. This session will be recorded, and you are currently in two-way audio mode. Please make sure that when you are not speaking, you mute the microphone. The control for that is up in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Also, if you experience any technical difficulties during today's event, you can turn your feedback color to red. That's also in the upper hand corner. If you have any questions, you can enter those using the Q&A pane in live meeting. Just click on Q&A, and then you can type in your question and click Ask. Also, at the end of the session, we will be uh, taking questions via voice. So at that time, you will be able to unmute yourself and ask your question. And we do ask that if you have a question, use the hand feature, which is up in the upper right-hand corner of the Q&A pane. And we can call on you to unmute your microphone. And now just one moment while I begin the recording for today's session. And now at this time, it is my pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Tracy Immel. Tracy, you now have the floor. Thank you so much, Heather, and welcome, everybody, all of those expert educators from around the world. I always get such a thrill when I uh, do these kinds of presentations and can see people from uh, the far reaches of the, of the world, Sri Lanka and Spain and Mexico, Russia, um, and here we sit uh, in, in Seattle. So welcome, everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending where in the world you are at. And it is my pleasure um, to uh, join you not only today, but uh, over the next um, three webinar series, including today. And I will also have the pleasure of meeting you all in Barcelona at the Global Forum uh, to work with you and learn with you um, specifically around 
21st century uh, learning design professional development model. I wanted to start with a little bit of background uh, about myself. Um, I've had one of the best jobs uh, in the world, other than being a teacher, I think. Um, I'm a teacher, but of a different sort. I've been working in the uh, profession of education, uh, specifically education and the integration of technology, for over 20 years. Uh, I've traveled to many places in the world uh, to observe technology being used, uh, to work with master trainers, uh, most recently, uh, I was in Malaysia and Bangladesh. Um, I've done some presenting at uh, regional forums in the past. On the screen, you see uh, me there in uh, Latin America, uh, in Peru, uh, last year. And I love, love uh, coaching and working with uh, adults who are lifelong learners and really wanting to continue their learning to become the best possible educators that they can be for our students, and that is what you all are as part of the Expert Educator uh, Program. Personally, I wanted to share a little bit about myself as well. Um, I have three children, ages 20, uh, 19, and 15. My daughter just graduated from high school and is at university now. And I was also recently remarried uh, in May. Um, that's my husband, Steve, down there in the corner. We got married in Arizona, and it was fabulous. It's great being a um, honeymooner again. Um, I am a freak for baby animals. If there's a baby animal, it is very difficult to turn me, uh, to peel me away. I can sit and watch um, animals for uh, ages. This little horse uh, I saw in Arizona, it was just two days old. It was so unbelievably cute. And um, I also have a passion for barbecue, American barbecue. And um, my husband and I have recently purchased a vintage trailer. So that is a 1947 uh, Nashua Turret. And he is refurbishing that. And hopefully this summer we'll be using that to uh, camp um, in some beautiful places here in the Pacific Northwest. So I want to learn a little bit uh, about you. And um, this is your first opportunity to uh, engage together. I'm very interested. How many years have you been teaching? You can go ahead and select um, the button um, interactively. And I'll give you just uh, 30 seconds to do that. And we can get a, a good idea of who's on the phone with us. So here is what I love, love, love about what I see. Um, you know, there is a misperception out there that, quote, unquote, older teachers uh, aren't innovative and don't know how to use technology well in, uh, in the classroom. And this is debunking that um, right here, because we have 28 uh, percent who have been teaching for over 11 years. 21% who have been in the classroom over 20 years, and just 2% of you who are new to the teaching profession. And to me, what this is uh, indicative of is that the way you become an innovative teacher, the way you embrace uh, new tools and new technologies to do a, a better job of delivering instruction to your students is less about how old you are and more about whether or not you are a lifelong learner. And so with that, please use the shared notes section. And I know it's not the ideal um, a tool for collaboration, but go ahead and, and type in uh, the shared notes section what keeps you motivated to be a lifelong learner. Students, yes. <laughs> Students keep us young, don't they? What else, everybody? What keeps you motivated to be a lifelong learner? The passion to learn in and of itself. My kids keep me motivated. If I don't keep up with the latest uh, news and, and gadgets, I would never talk to them. Um, I, I laughed because I had gotten angry at them. Uh, this was a couple of years ago because they, they weren't responding to my emails. 
And when I asked them about it, um, they said, Mom, no one emails anymore. You, you have to text or, or Facebook if you want us to respond, which uh, sure enough, so now we respond uh, via texting or Facebook messaging. Um, it's wonderful. Thank you, everybody, for doing the same things twice. That's me, too. So keep going. I'd love to copy and paste this. Uh, maybe, Rosanna, I could ask for your help and do a document, and we can, we can pull out some of these wonderful tidbits about what keeps you all motivated to be uh, lifelong learners. Uh, and it certainly is not age-related. So uh, being 47 myself, I am happy to see that we have evidence of that here on this call today. So our job together uh, today uh, is we'll, we'll take a look at trends that shape um, education. And we're going to look at the connection between uh, innovative teaching and whether that actually has an impact on student acquisition of 21st century skills. Um, I want to provide an overview of the different Microsoft professional development offerings for you. Um, because I know part of what you do as innovative educators and part of what you'll be doing more of as expert educators is really um, working with other teachers, uh, whether it's in a pure coaching kind of model or a more uh, formal you know, workshop or training environment. You'll be doing a lot of work with other educators. And so I want to make sure that you have uh, a good understanding of the different resources that Microsoft has. And many of these are in your playbook, uh, your expert educator playbook. So you may be familiar with some of them as well. Um, why we're going to be doing 21st century learning design over the next few sessions is because you will have an opportunity to take what you're learning um, as part of these webcast series and integrate it uh, and update your own learning activities that you submitted as part of you being chosen for the expert educator program. Um, as you know, your projects are going to be judged um, at the Global Forum, and the judging criteria will actually be, these, um, in part, these 21st century learning design rubrics. And so we want to make sure that you have a really good understanding and have an opportunity to practice um, coding using the 21st century learning design model. In addition, you'll be participating in a team competition, which is very exciting. Um, the Learnathon, and those Learnathon projects will also be using the 21st century learning design rubric as one way to as assess uh, who will be getting top honors uh, for those Learnathon projects. So we talk a lot about innovative teaching. We talk a lot about 21st century um, learning. We talk a lot about technology. And I think it's important for us to step back and to really say, why are these things important? Um, are they just buzzwords? Are they just kind of marketing fodder um, for a, a new uh, way of thinking? Or do they have real meaning? Is there a reason that we have you know, um, uh, really embraced these notions and that you know, technology is um, is increasing in leaps and bounds. We have one-to-one -one, uh, programs happening around the world. 32 million devices will be purchased globally for education um, this year alone. And so I think it's very important to, uh, to be able to articulate what is 21st century teaching? What do we mean by that? How does technology kind of um, play a, a role in that? and whether innovative teaching practices really does have uh, an impact on student acquisition of 21st century skills. I mean, I think that these statistics are the why. Why is it important? Why are we talking about this? And it's really because what we're doing today, maybe not what you're doing in your classroom, but you are the creme de la creme, but systemically we have 75 million youth that are unemployed, and 40% of employers that are actually saying that they have open positions, open vacancies, that cannot fill them due to lack of skills. And when our students are in high school in particular, we are losing them. 40 to 60% of them are chronically disengaged. They're not showing up for classrooms. They're not paying attention in class. They're bored. They are absolutely not learning to become those lifelong learners 
that is so important for the jobs that are open today, for the skill set that employers are looking for um, today. If you think about the different trends that are happening globally, um, you know, people today expect to be able to work and learn and study wherever and where, whenever they want. They're no longer tied to particular uh, desk jobs. We have the ubiquitous access of technology in the workforce. Uh, at home, students are using their cell phones um, to stay connected uh, all the time, every day, constantly. And over the next 10 years, the most um, innovative changes that are happening in education are likely to take place outside of traditional uh, institutions. So when you think about the uh, massively open online courses, um, otherwise known as MOOCs, um, that is a perfect example of amazing learning happening, um, some of it delivered by the top universities in the world, and it's all happening outside of the traditional classroom. We have over a million pieces of content being shared on social media. 120,000 blogs being created, two blogs per second, by 15-year-olds every single day, every single day. So these are the things that are happening outside of the classroom. And when you look at the classroom of the 19th century with, um, you know, the row, you know, desks all in a row, the teacher at the front of the classroom, the teacher being the imparter of, of knowledge, things, unfortunately, are not changing so much. These are all pictures of modern classrooms uh, taken over the last few years. And unfortunately, when we have classrooms that look like this, it's very difficult to get to a place of innovation, of a place that supports a different kind of, of learning, one where students are collaborating uh, together, one where they're working together to create new meaning, new knowledge. Um, new ways of, of learning. So if I think about what my learning ecosystem was like uh, when I was going to school, it looked like this. I had my parents. Um, I had my teacher. I probably had um, a librarian. I did. I had a great librarian, and I loved the library, both at school uh, and in my community. And I had my friends, uh, who unfortunately tended to give me wrong information, not right information. But this is what it looked like. It was pretty simple. Today's learning ecosystem for students, um, for my kids, for example, look more like this. Um, they may go to a uh, class and they may hear uh, a lecture, but then they might visit a, a chemistry a community online. They might uh, look at a um, chemistry lesson or a, a class lecture uh, on demand. They might look at an expert blog. Uh, there's all kinds of places out there um, where they can do these things with uh, Khan Academy. Um, for example, they might actually I am with a, uh, a an expert, a chemist. They might um, then come back to the classroom where the teacher says, "Now turn your page to chapter seven, you know, page 420." You've lost them. We've absolutely lost them. When this is what today's learning ecosystem looks like, and most classroom teachers are basically uh, teaching in a unidirectional model out of a textbook, we're going to learn lose our learners, and they're absolutely going to become disenfranchised with school. So this is an interesting um, picture. So on the left-hand side, we have a, a brain that is less active. These are brain scans. Um, both of uh, adolescent teenagers. Um, and on the right-hand side, you see a more active brain. So I want you to use your tools. These are called um, uh, whiteboard tools. They're down at the bottom. You can see a check mark. And if you click on that check mark, you can actually take uh, and mark what you think these students are doing. And I'd like you to, um, to do that now. OK. So we've got less active, 
a lot of people thinking they're either listening to a lecture um, or watching TV. And more active, they could be doing all of these things. It's kind of all over the map. Okay, well, here's what's interesting. I'm going to go on to the next slide. They're actually doing the same thing. They are using the Internet, but they're doing it differently. So the person on the right-hand side is using the Internet to collect data, and they're synthesizing that information to put it into a different context. On the left-hand side, they're searching the Internet, but they're simply consuming information. So sometimes we have this, um, this fallacy that if we just put technology into the hands of students, um, that magic will occur, and that we don't need a teacher to structure that lesson uh, in any way. They're smart enough, students are smart enough to figure it out, but here's a perfect example of how we know that that's not the case. One, just putting technology into the hands of the students is not the answer, and two, the reason that we need a professional educator in the classroom with the students is because we need the lesson to be structured in a way that will require those students to use that technology for higher order thinking skills. I don't know if you've read uh, the book. If you haven't, you might want to uh, take a look at it. It's by Daniel Pink. It was written in 2005 called A Whole New Mind. And he talks about something called the conceptual age. You know, education systems of the past supported the needs of the past. So if you think about in the industrial age, which is what really our current education models were created to serve, um, what we wanted was workers coming out of those schools um, to be competent but very task-oriented. The last thing you wanted a factory worker to do was to think um, innovatively and to daydream about creative ways to solve problems. You really wanted them to be very task-oriented and focused on doing one thing over and over and over again, and to do that one thing very competently. But today, what we need is, um, if, we're, if we're to hope um, to infuse 21st century skills, we, we need to basically have a conceptual age, a new era of work, where the economic demand of needing workers who are skilled in areas that are guided by the right side of the brain these creative areas around innovation and creativity, entrepreneurship, um, empathy, the ability to collaborate, the ability to play, all of these areas are guided on the, on, from the right-hand side of the brain. And so we have this challenge of having systems built for the industrial age but needing to graduate students who have 21st century skills of problem solving, um, the ability to do self-reflection, uh, creativity, et cetera. And the challenge is really, how do you fix this, you know, an airplane while it's flying? It's very difficult because our systems are very embedded. So we need teachers to, to think about things differently, even though sometimes the systems don't support them in that. What characteristics do you think a 21st century teacher needs? Can you use the shared notes section to, um, to type in your thoughts? I see creative, lifelong learner. They need to be a collaborator. They need to be able to network and know how to access open education resources. They need to be flexible. So what's interesting is all of these things are actually the same skills that we're wanting our students to learn. There's a gentleman by the name of Andrew Churches in the UK, and uh, he uh, is one of what I would call an innovative educator. And his uh, wiki site is great. You might want to check it out. He also uh, has a blog. But these are the characteristics that he's um, kind of said uh, are characteristics of a 21st century educator. And I think you've absolutely captured um, 
most of them, if not all of them. And I think all of these could be bundled up into what we at Microsoft, at least, have termed innovative. So what does innovative teaching look like? And does innovative teaching actually help students develop the skills they need? Um, and what are the school and system level conditions that can help innovative teaching and learning expand more broadly? So you are a group of 250 innovative educators. We absolutely know that. But our challenge, all of our challenges, is how do we scale those innovations out? How do we take the teacher that's next door to you in the classroom and maybe still teaching in a more traditional model? And what are the school conditions that can be changed in order to support that teacher uh, on his or her path to becoming an innovative teacher? And that is just the question that Microsoft and a number of partners had back in 2011. Um, they did a study called the Innovative Teaching and Learning um, Research Study along with SRI, or the uh, Stanford Research Institute. And they really sought to answer those two questions. What does more innovative teaching result in 21st century skill um, acquisition by students? And what are the system and school level changes that need to be in place in order to support that uh, change to happen? And here's what they learned. So innovative teaching plus ICT access, ubiquitous access to technology, actually does enable 21st century um, uh, skills in students. And what we mean by innovative teaching are these three things. Um, having the pedagogies be student-centered, taking the learning beyond the classroom, you know, is it uh, real world? Uh, can they apply the learning outside of the, the context of the classroom? Um, are they getting a global and uh, a broader uh, global understanding? And um, are there learning opportunities that happen outside of the school um, day? And then finally, not just the use of digital tools, but use of technology or ICT for higher order thinking skills, for things like knowledge building, collaboration, creativity, and innovation. What we know um, from the research and from the actual uh, observations is that the individual pieces are often there. So you might walk into a classroom and see great student-centered pedagogy happening. Um, you might see uh, learning going on outside of the classroom uh, via field trips or, or via um, a flipped classroom scenario. And there may be technology being used. But the challenge is that most of the time, these things are done and isolated. So the challenge for all of us is how do we bring these three things together at the same time? And those three things together um, are what we call innovative teaching practices. We know that when technology is being used, uh, unfortunately, it's being used primarily for the consumption of information. So you can see on the bottom of the chart these things where students are accessing class resources, where they're um, writing or, or editing stories, where they're taking um, tests, or they're finding information on the internet. Most of those tasks are really about consuming uh, of information. And what we need students to be doing to really uh, enable these 21st century skills is the more complex um, technology uses, the ones where you're using the technology to create something, to develop simulations, or collaborating with others um, from around the world, or at least outside of their classroom, um, doing simulations, creating animations, putting together multimedia presentations. And again, not for the sake of creating a, a fancy, good-looking presentation, but because it requires a higher level of synthesis of information to create a compelling multimedia presentation than it does to, to simply write a report. So this is our goal, everybody. This is our task uh, for the next 12 months, is to help other educators uh, around the world um, use technology in, in more um, ways to create new knowledge as opposed to consume it. The other really interesting thing that we found out as part of this research is that um, when learning activities are designed specifically to 
enable 21st century skills, that 21st century skills are actually what comes out from the student's work. So that is a very easy way to look at this fancy chart and say, when a learning activity is designed intentionally to elicit 21st century skills, when student work uh, is turned in and students are actually presenting their work, we see a higher um, likelihood that their work is going to reflect those 21st century skills. And when we looked at what are the school attributes um, of the most, where there is most innovative teaching practices happening, what are the school attributes? And the number one uh, attribute of the most innovative schools in the world was collaboration among educators. So we need to have technology being used for higher order thinking. We need to have learning activities being designed explicitly with 21st century uh, goals in mind, 21st century skills in mind. And we need to encourage collaboration among educators. And when you combine all of those things, you will start to see innovation scale uh, among schools and systems. So we're going to start talking a little bit about the professional development um, programs that Microsoft offers. And I'm curious, I'm sure all of you have participated in professional development uh, in your career. What would you say are the most impactful professional development models? And again, you can use the tick marks on the bottom to go ahead and, uh, and choose what has worked best for you. A lot of people saying receiving or delivering coaching. Observing lessons. Reviewing and talking about student work. And unconference style PD. I'm interested in what that means. At the end, whoever said that can help us all know what that means. Oh, yeah, you can write in. Happy to. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. OK, so here's what's interesting, is if you look at what people are saying, as trainers, as peer coaches ourselves, we need to keep this in mind. But because, because what works for one person doesn't work for everybody. and the most compelling professional development actually is a number of these styles, a number of these things combined together. So when we ask this question to educators in the research, um, this is what they said. The most effective professional development was actually practicing a new teaching method, doing research on a particular area, or sometimes it's called action research, um, planning or practicing the use in the, uh, in the classroom, and forgive me for some reason in, um, uh, in the uh, platform, it's, it's not showing uh, the content correctly. But basically, what this says is keep this in mind as you're working with your um, uh, teachers that you're going to be for coaching or if you're going to be doing workshops or training yourself, keep in mind that a blended model is what works best. And what Microsoft has done in all of their professional development is try to give you tools that you can use in this blended model. And really, how important it is to ask your learner, um, to ask your uh, coachee, what is going to work best for them. And in all likelihood, it's going to be a range of, of um, observing, lecture, um, doing action research, uh, attending teach me, uh, and getting uh, individual coaching and, and practicing. So how can we all collectively support educators through this transformation? And specifically, how, what, what's the thinking that is on, um, on behind the scenes with Microsoft as they've created kind of a, a scaffold or a structure to support educators, no matter where they fall um, on the comfort level of, of technology? 
Some of you might be familiar with um, the UNESCO ICT competency framework for teachers. This is just one framework of a range of competency frameworks for educators around the use of technology uh, in teaching and class, um, teaching and learning. Um, you may have heard of uh, the ISTE framework, which is the uh, International Society for Technology uh, in Education. Um, there's the uh, EU uh, TQF framework, which is a European Union framework. It's really not important what the framework is because uh, 80 to 90 percent of the competencies that they list are similar. In the UNESCO framework, they happen to um, have looked at it across six different um, kind of domains, uh, understanding the connection between uh, government policy and what happens in the classroom, curriculum and assessment, pedagogy, uh, the use of technology, uh, organization and administration, and teacher professional development. And then if you go to the right, you'll see each of those columns is labeled technology literacy, knowledge deepening, and knowledge creation. And you can think of those as levels or approaches. Um, they might be role-based. Uh, they might be um, depending on your country context uh, or at where an individual teacher plays. There's different um, learning objectives kind of underneath each one of these boxes. And so that has been kind of the foundation of how Microsoft has started to think about their professional development offerings. So before we start with an overview of what those offerings are, can you um, let me know which of the following um, offers you're familiar with? And it's OK if you're not. That's what today is for. And that's what your expert educator playbook is for. OK. So we've got kind of a, a range of um, percentages. And I have a feeling um, that we can only choose one option. So Heather, take note. Let's figure out how we change this for, um, for this afternoon's um, uh, webinar. But basically, what I'm seeing is that you have some level, many of you have some level of awareness. It looks like most uh, awareness is around teaching with technology, which is great. Um, that is our newest offering. And so for those of you who aren't familiar, we're going to go through that right now. And then we'll spend um, more time kind of talking about um, the uh, professional development around 21st century learning design, because that's what we'll be focused um, for our next webinar series. So if you think about how our professional development offers align to the UNESCO framework, you can think about it in this way. Um, digital literacy, without any integration of um, tutorials or lesson examples from the Partners in Learning Network, really is about learning digital literacy and productivity tools. And then you can see how the professional development offers kind of align uh, in general to the UNESCO framework. One of the things that's really important to keep in mind and to think about as you make your plans for how you want to work with other teachers uh, in enabling their use of technology in more innovative ways is that one approach is to do it in a kind of hierarchical where you would point them to the teaching with technology curriculum or you would point them to um, digital literacy depending on their skill level or you might do a 21st century learning design um, workshop but one of the ways that we've seen that's very, very effective is to kind of spiral the curriculum in a just-in-time kind of a way. So you might start by having them look at a learning activity using the 21st century learning design um, rubric to, to then get ideas about how they might incorporate technology into those learning activities. And you might point them to a particular unit of teaching with technology, for example, the one on uh, collaboration. Um, and then if there are ideas that they have, like they want to use um, Skype in the classroom, for example, or they want to use um, the uh, editing features in Word and don't know how, then you might want to go um, to a specific digital literacy uh, topic that will help um, them get that specific skill. 
the reason why this approach tends to be most impactful is because when you're done working with that teacher, they actually have one activity that they feel confident to go try in the classroom. Um, and it, it's something that takes less time and it feels like it's more individualized for what they can do um, right away. On the other hand, it's okay. Some of your um, people that you work with might be very interested in taking a Teaching with Technology course kind of end to end and getting the certificates, and, and that will enable them to get ideas uh, for what they want to do. So just consider these two different approaches. Tracy, sorry to interrupt. There is sure. one question that I think could be um, valuable for everyone. If you can touch a little bit more about the Microsoft um, Certified Educator, the certificate. Um, I'm getting a couple of questions around that, and I'm getting a request for you to slow down just a tiny bit. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the feedback. So the Microsoft Certified Educator exam will cover that um, as part of the presentation. So when I get to that slide, I'll talk about it, and I'll pause to enable any questions. And again, for those of you who uh, are not native English speakers, I apologize for going too quickly, and I'll, uh, I'll try to slow down. So digital literacy has been around for a, a long time. And digital literacy, the thing that's important to know is this is really a curriculum that can help any educators in your school who don't have basic computer skills or basic productivity tools skills. There's a new course that's just been released that is for Windows 8 and Office 365. But there are a range of um, versions depending on what particular operating system and productivity um, suite you are using. So what you're seeing here is this particular uh, curriculum is the standard curriculum. And it includes five classes, computer basics, and it's really basic, like very basic, um, computer basic, uh, an introduction to kind of the internet and the World Wide Web, a basic introduction to productivity programs like Microsoft Word uh, and Excel. It talks about computer security and privacy and introduces kind of social media or the digital lifestyle. So just make sure that you set expectations with any educators that you might point them this um, resource to is that in and of itself, this is not in the education context. And you can use the resources that are on the Partners in Learning Network and the tutorials that are on the Partners in Learning Network um, to supplement this content uh, in a way that becomes um, more relevant to education. Uh, in addition, after the Global Forum, we'll be providing you some uh, resources to help with training specifically. Uh, and access to a training provider portal. But right now, we just want you to focus on your own learning activities, your own learning, getting familiar with the content, getting ready for the Global Forum. And then after the Global Forum, we'll um, do another webinar and expose you to some additional tools that you can use. There are a series of small uh, assessments that you can have um, someone who you may be coaching uh, take, and, and they will recommend um, particular units of study. And so in this case, um, the personalized learning plan is recommending to take uh, a topic around using the mouse uh, and keyboarding shortcuts. So you can see that this is very uh, basic. These are the learning objectives that it covers. Um, if I were to, to take the particular course that was recommended, or it's just a little lesson, it's on identifying different uh, groups of keys. So, you know, the, the old Control-Alt-Delete shortcut would be an example. And how to perform different tasks with a mouse, um, being able to right-click, things of that nature. And I, I'm showing this to you because many of you come from countries where um, you know, there are teachers who still really struggle with the basics of computer operations and um, productivity tools. So I wanted to make sure that you were aware that there are resources um, for those educators uh, 
at, at Microsoft. Then when they have those basic skills and they're, you know, they're asking, how do I apply these in education? How do I apply these in the context of education? Teaching with Technology is a uh, e-learning course that was created about three years ago um, and has just been um, picking up interest. We've had uh, almost 10,000 uh, people study the Teaching with Technology um, coursework and over uh, 30,000 hours of uh, educators utilizing this content. This is kind of my one slide what it is. So remember the UNESCO competency framework for teachers. It covers the learning objectives that are in the technology literacy approach or level. It's made up of three different components. The self-assessment, and that takes about um, 45 minutes or so to do, uh, and that creates an individualized learning plan. Then there's six courses of, of e-learning. One of the things that you need to make sure to, to make your learners aware of is that even though there's 36 hours of content, it doesn't mean that everybody needs to take 36 hours of content. By taking the self-assessment, you're only identifying and, and recommending those courses or those units of study that, um, where there are learning gaps. And each of those courses are embedded with um, case studies and different activities and tutorials so that uh, if, if a learner was really motivated, there's not only kind of the knowledge acquisition that can happen, but there are opportunities for them to go practice um, their knowledge in the classroom with their students or at least uh, on their own in a professional context. You can earn a, a badge um, once you complete all six summative assessments um, on the Partners in Learning uh, Network. And then there is an optional Microsoft Certified Educator exam, and I will talk about that more uh, in just a minute. So this is what the self-assessment um, looks like. And we are doing uh, some changes uh, in the next couple of months. You, you might see some changes. We've learned um, from uh, the, the users that have gone through it, and we're trying to optimize based on their feedback. But if you go to the Partners in Learning Network, this is uh, what you'll see. Uh, there's a self-assessment, recommended courses, and all courses. So if you want to see all the courses available, you can click on that third tab. And then once you create your customized learning plan, um, the recommended courses based on that learning plan will populate. For any of you who have done this and have found that the recommended courses aren't immediately there, um, there's a web service that connects it, and there's sometimes a delay. So just know that um, if you're doing this with, with others or you're instructing um, or asking others to do it, there can be a delay between the time the self-assessment is completed and the time that the recommended courses populate. But don't worry, the data has been saved. Once you complete your self-assessment, you'll get an individualized learning plan that looks like this. And each of the lines is the learning objectives from the UNESCO competency framework. So it's not the courses, uh, it's not in the language of the courses, it's in the language of the learning objectives. And then when you go into the recommended courses, you'll actually see the ones that tie to these individual learning objectives. When you launch a topic, um, each topic ranges um, between 20 and 45 minutes. Um, most of them will have a small audio portion um, to kind of set the context for what will be learned. And then there's a range of activities, um, reading, uh, case studies, examples. In this case, the learner drops a, a technology enhanced way of doing uh, something compared to a traditional way. And so it's a little interactive exercise that makes the content a bit more interesting. 
the way we show um, examples of things is by using this show me box. So in this case, we're talking about using technology as an uh, assessment tool and in particular formative assessment. So when you click on an example, the learner is going to get this uh, example of a PowerPoint presentation that has been used as a formative assessment tool by embedding action buttons onto the slide. And as the learner clicks through, it talks about, um, through these little uh, text boxes, how uh, you can use PowerPoint and action buttons as a formative assessment tool. And then if you were to click the How To button in the course, what comes up is a step-by-step -step tutorial for embedding action buttons into a PowerPoint presentation. We worked with um, over 170 uh, educators and education uh, experts from around the world to create this content. And one of the things that we asked them all um, is for each learning objective, we asked them, uh, how difficult is this? What are some of the best practices? And where do educators tend to have difficulty um, in performing this particular uh, task? And we've taken that information and cre created these Ask the ex Experts. So in this particular case, Ken is talking to Soraya, and Ken is basically telling Soraya that he was very frustrated because he, he did a lesson with his students um, that required internet searching, and he was disappointed in how long it took and in the results that the students got. And Zariya, in turn, is making suggestions for how Ken could adjust his, um, his lesson to scaffold it in a different way so that students have more um, specific instructions or guided by essential questions when doing their, uh, their internet research. So that's how we utilize the, uh, the input from all of these uh, global education experts. As I mentioned, um, we have a new offering. It was launched in spring, uh, and so many people still don't know about it. It's called the Microsoft Certified Educator. Um, this is a certification offering from Microsoft, similar and different to other Microsoft certified offers. So you may have heard about the Microsoft Office Specialist exam or the Microsoft Technology Associate um, certification or Microsoft Solution Provider certification. That is the way it's similar. It's a, a valid and reliable assessment of educator competencies. So it looks at the learning objectives, the assessment objectives from the UNESCO competency framework in the technology literacy um, approach or level and created a computer-based exam that will be a valid and reliable measure of whether the educator can apply the skills into a different context in education. So this is not a technology exam. So it is not measuring whether you know how to use Microsoft Word or whether you understand the features of Excel. In fact, it's a technology neutral exam. What it does is provide, it, it, it may give a role play, for example, or a, um, I'm sorry, a case study and talk about the learning objectives for a particular lesson. And it will ask the test taker if they can identify the most appropriate tool that would be used to achieve the learning objectives in that case study. So it might say, um, uh, uh, if, if your learning objective was to enable collaboration among students, what would be the most appropriate um, tool? And it might list, you know, Excel. It might list um, uh, Office 365, Web Apps. It might list um, uh, a, a Skype, for example. And then um, the person sitting for the exam would need to choose the, the best answer. Um, it does cost to take the exam, and the exam is delivered via CertiPort testing centers. Currently, the exam is available in English, 
and Russian. Um, and soon will be available in the uh, January to February time frame in Spanish, Portuguese, uh, Arabic, um, uh, Indonesian, uh, Mandarin. I believe that's, that's it. Um, so, and the teaching with technology content uh, in the February, March time frame will also be available in those additional languages. Again, Spanish, uh, Brazilian, Portuguese, um, Mandarin, Indonesian, Arabic. There is um, a level 300, 21st century learning design. And level 300 is um, our, what we will be spending the next uh, two webcasts on. And excuse me one minute. I'm going to put you on mute for just one second. We had a little a logistical challenge. The office I'm sitting in, uh, which I was told was available, is not. So I'm going to continue. The person whose office I'm sitting in is gracious enough. They're going to go get some coffee. So I apologize for that interruption. So 21st century learning design um, takes all of the things that we've learned about good professional development um, and the research that we went over, the innovative teaching and learning research, and, and puts it together in this 21st century learning design professional development model. It incorporates um, educators collaborating uh, together, practice and analysis of their own learning activities, um, as well as sample learning activities, redesigning um, learning activities based on these rubrics, and then looking at what are the student 21st century skills that are a result of designing these learning activities in this way. There are six different rubrics, and the way it works is this. Basically, this is a very simplified approach, and we will actually be practicing this on the next call. So each of the six uh, 21st century uh, learning uh, dimensions has a corresponding rubric, and asks a series of questions. Now, the details underneath these questions are what's really important to understand how to code your learning activities and how to guide others in coding theirs. But in a very simplified way, it basically, the first step would be, are students required to work in pairs or groups? If the answer is no, then that learning activity would score a 1. If the answer is yes, you move on to the next question. These students have shared responsibility, and we'll learn a lot about what does shared responsibility mean. Um, and if the answer is no, then that lesson scores a two. If, there, if the answer is yes, you move on to the next. Students are making substantive decisions together, and then students' work is interdependent. So this is a very simplified way of, of how we will work together, and we'll look at some sample learning activities and have you score them while we're on the phone together. And we'll have some conversations about why you think it's scored uh, as a 2, why other people may think it's scored as a 3. And the idea is not that there's a, a necessarily a right or a wrong answer, which there is, but that's not the point. The learning really comes from the, these conversations. And then we'll have an opportunity for, uh, for you in between webinars to go and adjust, uh, score your own learning activity that you submitted, and make adjustments that you think are appropriate for your learning activity. One of the things I really want to highlight is that it's not appropriate for every learning activity to score high on all six dimensions. And that's OK. But this is a very um, kind of concrete tool that can be used um, to evaluate if your learning activity does include collaboration, is there a way that you can adjust it so that students not only have shared responsibility, but also are making substantive decisions together? 
And again, this is uh, one of the ways that the learning activities will be evaluated at the Global Forum, as well as the team projects in the Learnathon. The six different dimensions of um, 21st century learning design, where we currently have rubrics, are uh, collaboration, knowledge construction, the use of ICT for learning, self-regulation, skilled communication, and real-world problem solving. So the next um, webcast will look at collaboration and knowledge construction. The following webcast, I think uh, we're going to look at use of ICT for learning and real-world problem solving and innovation. And then um, hopefully at the Global Forum, we'll be able to cover uh, the last two. But you will have all of them uh, on your own. So uh, you'll be able to do some work on your own as well. When we work with schools um, across uh, a, a year, right, so this isn't something that should be done in a workshop and then kind of left, the way you achieve the greatest results across the school system would be to have an entire school working together on maybe two or three rubrics um, for an entire year. So for example, I'm working with a school in uh, Bellevue, Washington right now. Um, I'll engage with them seven different uh, times throughout the school year in kind of a, a coaching model, modeling very much what I'll be doing with you uh, in the webcast and what you'll be doing independently uh, in between the times. Um, the only big difference is that uh, as uh, individual educators in uh, each of your own locations, there's not a natural way uh, for you to collaborate together, but I certainly hope that you'll take use um, take adv full advantage of the technology available to you and um, choose to maybe put together some collaborative groups uh, that could work together on these things. Um, and the learning is always better, and the results are always better. So you can see here uh, in this one dimension of real world problem solving, in a course of a year, uh, at the beginning of the year before the school engaged in this learning, they were scoring in the uh, mid uh, ones, uh, you know, let's say an average of 1.5 um, across the rubric, and in one year they were scoring uh, much higher uh, on the on the rubric. And keep in mind that this school in Russia was one of the most innovative schools, um, and yet their learning activities had a lot of air, uh, room for improvement around the 20th century learning design. So our learning together uh, uh, over the next um, two webinars and then hopefully Global Forum will be, we'll look at a, a 21st century learning rubric, we'll sample some learning activities. Um, in between the webinar, you'll code your own learning activity, you'll make some adjustments. Hopefully uh, you'll have an opportunity to, to test those adjustments with your students. Um, you'll share kind of um, what your results are, what your challenges are. Hopefully you'll work with your community of expert educators um, together. And then we'll come back together for another webcast and look at some additional rubrics. And it's this uh, continual process of incremental improvement that will make a difference both to your own learning activities over time, um, but to those with uh, the, the teachers that you're working with as well. So um, again, this is what our, our path looks like going forward. We'll uh, do collaboration and knowledge construction on January 8th, and you will have some homework. We'll be sending uh, an email out uh, after this session um, with all of the documents that you'll need to do the homework. Basically, it's this. I want you to read the collaboration and knowledge construction rubric. You'll receive all the rubrics for all six dimensions, but really just focus in on a, a couple, you know, really make sure that you're going to take the learning deeply uh, as opposed to trying to understand it all at the same time. Um, you'll have a few sample learning activities. It's only important for you to look at these right before the webcast, the learning activities, because if you read them, um, you know, in the next few days, uh, you'll have forgotten them. Uh, by the time we get on, and these are the learning activities that we'll be using um, to code uh, during the webcast. So you'll want to read these um, pretty close to the um, webcast, refresh your memory on the knowledge uh, rubric, um, the collaboration rubric, and the knowledge construction rubric, and this will enable us to spend a lot less time 
in silence while people are reading and a, a lot more time uh, having discussions and, and talking about um, how these activities would code, why we think they would code that way, and how we can improve them. The other thing I'm sending you is a um, 21st century learning design journal. Uh, it's a self-reflection exercise, and um, I highly encourage you to kind of capture your thinking um, at the end of each session. Um, and this is something that you can do uh, right away because it starts off by just asking some, um, some general questions about you as an educator, uh, your relationship with your peers, um, how you currently collaborate, and then you can stop when it gets to the place where it's starting to talk um, specifically about the six dimensions of 21st century learning. Tracy, can you please touch on whether the 21st century learning design is going to be available in different languages? I'm being asked this question. So um, the 21st century learning design that will come across in the, um, uh, in the email is uh, English. Um, however, a couple of things. Um, first is please take full use of the uh, translation tools that come embedded in Office 365. Uh, if you're not using the, uh, the web applications at a minimum, um, you can do kind of um, translation uh, within the document. Uh, I know it's not perfect because it's machine translation, but it should be good enough. Um, for you to understand. Um, the second thing is that I do believe we have some of the rubrics that have been uh, translated. And um, Razan, uh, I'll, I'll ask you to work with me to, to find those. So I, I believe that they've been um, localized into uh, Arabic and uh, Spanish, but I don't believe the learning activities have been. So the rubrics, I think, have been. I don't think the learning activities have been. So please um, use the translation tools that are available on, uh, on the internet or uh, collaborate with um, uh, someone who speaks your English, uh, your, your native language, and who is um, also uh, has strong skills in, in English. Other questions? Anything else I can answer? There is a yes. question whether they can work in uh, pairs with regards to this activity. And it's, if it's OK with you, Tracy, I would suggest that for this activity in particular, the work needs to be um, individual. Do you agree or? Um, so I actually disagree. Um, but That's fine. But I can't, I can't speak to, uh, to the impact on the, their individual learning projects. But I, I believe that better learning will always happen um, more collaborative, you know, in a more collaborative environment. Razan, when will the, um, the Learnathon teams be assigned? The Learnathon teams will be assigned on the next call. So on the January call, you will be, all the teachers will be put in groups, which you will need to work on the Learnathon um, um, project at the forum within that group. OK, so here's why I ask. So those of you who are interested in working collaboratively, it might be uh, interesting to work in your Learnathon group, uh, which will be assigned the next session. Um, however, if you have people that you already know and you and you want to do this, um, you know, uh, work collaboratively, I think it's absolutely fine. Um, for those of you who are saying that um, you did not feel we we met our learning objective, what I want to encourage you to do is to um, send uh, questions or clarifications that are needed to uh, Razan and. Um, and, and maybe it was just a you know a tool thing, um, but please, if if you're struggling to to understand um, some of the things that we attempted to do today, and you would like some clarity, please do uh, email uh, Razan, and we can work together to ensure you have um, the answers that you need. 
I do have I do have maybe two minutes, three minutes for questions. So if there are um, questions that would help you un, uh, understand uh, more, please feel free to uh, uh, speak. You can unmute yourself and ask the question verbally, or you can type the question uh, in the Q and A pane. Tracy, not more than that, sorry, but it, we're already 10 minutes over time and I do need to present um, yep. the digital story. Yep, no, two, two pieces, two, two minutes, that's all. Okay, well, I'm concerned about those, those uh, few check marks in the no box, so I'm, I'm asking for you um, all as lifelong learners who are responsible for your own learning outcomes to please email uh, Radon uh, with your questions that need clarifying, and I'll be happy to work with her to, uh, to answer those. I thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate uh, the opportunity um, to learn with you, and I'm very excited to have our next uh, call uh, on January 8th, and to meet you all face-to-face -face at the forum. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Tracy. This has been wonderful, and you know I've heard all of this multiple times, and every single time I just think it's very eye-opening, and it makes me think about different stuff related to teaching and learning. And I hope it has the same effect on every one of you attending today. So, um, moving on, we have uh, 20 more minutes, and um, I want to make sure we capture every one of. Uh, of these minutes in a very efficient way. I know on the last call, we have been asked by many of you about what is it that you need to present um, at the forum. So we talked about the digital story, and then we were asked quite a few questions on what do you mean by digital story, how do we need to prep for that. So this is what I am going to present to you um, within the coming few minutes. But before I do that, I want to just do a little reminder of what we discussed last time. So we had the welcome call on November 20th, and we have, um, this is the first webinar on to get you ready for the Microsoft in Education Global Forum. So this is happening today, and we have another session at um, 5 p.m. Pacific time this afternoon if you feel like you want to um, attend another session. It's going to be the same material, so it's not going to be different. We will also send you a recap of this session, including the homework that um, uh, that Tracy just uh, talked to you about and the documents within the coming few days. Um, just a little reminder, there is another webinar, and that's the second of a series of three webinars that's going to get you ready to attend um, the forum, I'm going to talk to you about 21st century learning design. The second webinar is on January 8th, and the third webinar is on February 5th. We will be sending you reminders to register for those, um, for those webinars, and if you have issues in getting the invitation to those uh, webinars, then feel free to email your community manager.
technology that you've used in your learning activity and how you manage to use it in a very innovative way. And it's also important to talk about um, how you integrated or how learning happened beyond the classroom. So when um, when you are within the exhibit sitting there and the judging, um, the judges would come over to your um, to your exhibit to learn about your learning activity. We are giving each and every teacher three minutes to explain your learning activity to the judges. You digital story. So I always say practice makes perfect. So please feel free and keep practicing, put together your digital uh, story and practice it so you are very crisp in your messages when the judges are there um, for you to be able to go through everything within three minutes. Um, so in a nutshell, this is your sort of the elevator pitch you're going to use for, um, for the learning activity you put together. One important thing for you to keep in mind is that the video you put together within the application, that will be viewed by the judges, and it will be viewed ahead of time. So you do not need to include that video within your digital story. Now, probably you're going to ask me, what is the format of the digital story? So we would like the digital story to be in PowerPoint. So that is the basis of the format of the digital story. And then you can be as innovative as you like within um, how you present that. You want to include pictures, feel free to do that. You want to include videos, please feel free to do that as long as it sort of includes um, everything we talked about when it comes to student outcomes, collaboration, learning beyond the classroom, and um, and everything else that you've planned for your learning activity. But the last thing I want to say is, um, and this is more on the logistical side, um, you will each get your own little table at the exhibit. So you will have a little table, and then um, using your Microsoft device, you will be able to present that to um, the judges. The, your digital story. Now, what we are trying to do is that we're trying to get monitors that you can use to be able to screen your digital story a little bit bigger than um, than a smaller tablet, but that's still not confirmed. We are working on that, and hopefully, we will um, get to get to do that um, for this year. If you want to put together posters that describe your learning activity, if you want to have handouts ready for the judges and other educators, or you want to decorate your table with flags and with other things, then feel free to bring whatever you need for your table um, um, with you when you go to Barcelona. One thing that is um, I want to point you to is a digital story guidance document. If you look on your right-hand side, you will see a little icon with um, three little papers on it. If you click on that, you will be able to download the digital story guidance document. We will also include that in the recap email in case you did not have the opportunity to download it here. Um, with that, I am done with my slides. I can see that there is a lot of questions. So, um, so what I'm going to do is read those questions and try to answer them. Um, so again, the digital story guidance uh, final document is basically this document is going to walk you through what we mean by digital, digital story in a little bit more detail. For the sizes of the stand and the exhibit, we will get that to you as soon as we have it. We're working on that, and you will get that information very, very soon from us. What kind of um, training of the playbook is best suited for someone who is already, um, well, what the kind of training that is suited for someone who is already good in 21st century uh, skills is basically what Tracy was um, 
was walking you through earlier today, I would say one of two things is um, will be um, very useful for educators who are more advanced in technology and 21st century skills. The two um, uh, professional development resources I would point you to is teaching with technology and also what Tracy is going to walk you through in a bit more details on um, the January call and the February call, which is 21st century learning design. Those are very useful resources and professional development for teachers who are more advanced in 21st century skills. You mentioned the learning video. Um, yes, the learning activity and the video both can be updated as you see fit between now and the forum. The judging process will start before the forum. This is when the judges will take a look at your application and your learning activity and your video ahead of the forum. And then it will be um, continued at the forum where you will have your three-minute um, time to really walk the judges through um, your learning activity and tell them a little bit more about it. Can, can I bring a small projector? Sure, you can bring a small projector um, if it helps you um, with your digital story. We can decide. Yes, the members of the Learnathon will be decided ahead of time. We will um, we will put you in groups on the next call, which is which takes place in January. Do we need to make a VCT? No, you do not need to make a VCT. You need to replace the, we're replacing the VCT with a digital story, which is the PowerPoint you're going to put together to display your learning activity. Um, when do you need to prepare the digital story? This is something that you will need to bring with you to the forum. So there is no need to prepare that ahead of time, it just needs to, um, you need to bring it with you to the forum. PowerPoint only, yes, PowerPoint only, but you can be as creative and as innovative, and we absolutely encourage the creativity and innovation within, within PowerPoint. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yes? Yes, for, for yes. So if we're breaking in the middle of the question, but if I understood it well, there is no need for a VCT, and the replacement of the VCT is basically the digital story, which is in PowerPoint format. No, you don't need to upload anything else. What you need to do is bring your digital story to the forum. We're asked about adapters. Yes, you do need to bring your own adapters to the forum. And this is something that's a little bit difficult. And the reason why you need to do that from your end is because adapters are very different from one another. So that's something. Yes, enough. 
Yes. Thank you for your question. Yes, internet connection will be available, and um, you know, in some cases with a large group of people, it might not be as reliable as we would like it to be. But internet connection, we are working on that, and it will be available. Sorry, I need to walk. I need to go through other questions. I'll give you a little bit of time towards the end if you have more questions. But I need to go through other questions from other educators, if you don't mind. Hopefully, they'll answer some of your questions anyway. Uh, uh, we're, we're getting a question. Does the Microsoft device have to be our, our new Surface, or can we use a personal laptop? You can use a personal laptop if you prefer. The, what we are trying to do is that we are trying to actually um, give you the Surfaces at the forum. This we are working on. It's not confirmed 100%. But the idea is that you will get the surfaces at the forum. Um, when exactly will the judges look at the video? The judging will start in January. So this is when the judges will start looking at their videos. Um, we talked about the surface devices. At this stage, we're trying hard to get them to you at the forum. There is no uh, template for the PowerPoint. We want you, the reason why there is no template is because we want you and expect you to be innovative. So, but the guidance document should give you enough uh, parameters on what you need to include in that PowerPoint. You can include a video in that PowerPoint. Um, yes, the Learnathon will be a competition, and it will be a group competition. So next call, you will be placed within a group of teachers, and you will need to work with them on the Learnathon project. As I said, judging will start in January. Yes, you can update the video. I have two more minutes. I'm going to use them to answer more questions. When we talk about improving the learning activity, does that mean we can remove, upload the learning activity and upload? In? No, you will need to work on improving the one that already exists within your um, expert educator application. Hello. So could we? Hello, can you listen to me? Yes. Yeah. We can hear you. Go ahead. Uh, hello, my name is Anna. I'm from Guatemala. I just have a question. The, you were saying that we were supposed to change or uh, readapt our learning activities. So are we supposed to uh, try the new one with the students? Because the school year in Guatemala just ended. So I really couldn't e do it with my last students. Sure. So, so it's not a must that you work on your learning activity more. Um, we're just giving that as an option for those who would like to add stuff or enhance their learning activity. So if you, you have already submitted your learning activity and you've been selected based on that, so we're sure your learning activity is great. But you always have the option to improve it only if you want to improve your learning activity. OK, thank you very much. Sure. Um, we are trying to get you surfaces at the forum, but if you want to bring your own Windows 8 machine or Windows machine, laptop, tablet, um, feel free to do that. Um, you will not have a projector, but we're trying hard to get monitors that you can use for the presentation for your judges. Um, unfortunately, it will not be a Surface 2, but it will be a Surface RT machine. Um, so with regards to posters, will there be a place to hang the posters? Um, so imagine a little table with, um, with a chair that you can sit on. Um, probably, possibly, you can hang it right in front of the table. There will be places to hang a poster if you decide to bring one. This year, posters 
are not um, are basically optional. So if you'd like to have a poster, you're welcome to do that. If you'd like to have handouts or other decorative stuff for your tables, you are more than welcome to do that. The difference between the VCT and the digital story is that the VCT is basically a template, while within the digital story, we're basically not providing you with a template. We want you to be as innovative and as creative as you would like. Will there be um, stages in the competition? As with previous forums. I'm not sure I understand the question, so um, please feel free to unmute yourself and uh, explain your, your question to me. So the judging will start in January. So if you want to um, enhance your learning activity or enhance your video, you can do it anytime until you get to the forum. But um, the earlier, the better, so the judges can see your enhanced version of the video or learning activity. There is no latest date for enhancing your video or learning activity as long as it's before the forum. So you can. Keep enhancing until you get to the forum. And with regards to the digital story, yes, you just bring that with you to Barcelona. You, you do not need to upload it um, anywhere. And I think with this, I managed to answer all questions. We are two minutes over time, but if there is one last question, if someone wants to um, unmute themselves and ask any question, then feel free to do that. We, I'll give you three more minutes to do that, and then I want to be respectful of everyone's time, so I won't take um, more than three more minutes. Anyone uh, more? Can you, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Should, should the PowerPoint last three minutes? Is it, Are they going to... Uh, watch a three-minute PowerPoint, or are we going to talk for three minutes? You're going to talk for three minutes, so you can have as many slides as you like. So the PowerPoint can last longer. They're not going to watch it while we're talking. Yes, they're going to watch the PowerPoint while you're talking. So you're going to walk them through the PowerPoint. So okay, we're so not putting any limits on the number of slides. As yeah. long as you manage to explain it to them and walk them through it within three minutes. Three minutes. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? So with regards to the homework and what you need to do, um, what the, Tracy, the homework Tracy gave you, we will no. definitely send that to you in the recap email that you will get within the coming few days. You will get all the documents, the details on the homework, and everything else. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, we are from Chile. Uh, we are kind of confused now because you said three minutes just to the PowerPoint, right? So, so, sorry for confusing you. What mm -hmm. I meant to say is that the, the, the number of slides within your PowerPoint can be as you see fit. There is not a limit on the number of slides. However, mm -hmm. you need to walk the judges through those slides in three minutes. Does that make sense? What is, yeah, and what is the time that I have to... What is the time that do I have to present our project, for example? What is the time, the right time? Three minutes. Yes. For all the project? For your project, you, each and every teacher, will have three minutes to walk the judges through their learning activity. And oh, the okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. I have a question about the, our own table we have uh, to have at the exhibit. Uh, what about the uh, size of that uh, table? 
about the fosters that we are we are going to have if we are going to have yes um we will get you this information we do not have this information yet but we okay. will get you as soon as we can you will get that information from your community manager okay thank you thank you you're most welcome yeah. uh, could you tell us if uh, the judges will ask questions after the three minutes talk yes yeah, yes yeah. And yeah. for how long? If they need if they need any kind of clarification, then they will absolutely ask questions. Okay, but do we know how long the the, the whole thing will go on? No, it really. I mean, it, they need it to get as much information as they um, they feel they need for them to be able to um, judge each and every educator with with you know being fair about judging each and every educator. Yeah. So. Um, so I'm expecting them to and to ask questions. Absolutely. All right. And will it, will that be will that be uh, all in English? Yeah. The whole talking will be done in English. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yes, that I did not answer, and it's related to the. Um, I believe that judging criteria. Um, the judging criteria is basically going to. Um, be very aligned with the 21st century learning design that Tracy started talking you through earlier today. So this is why it's important for you to do your homework and to be on the January and the February calls for you to be aware and to be um, to be very um, deeply um, aware of how you are going to be evaluated. Any more questions? I think we're seven minutes over time now, and I will allow one last question, and then yeah, I, we I, need to know another thing. Go ahead. Uh, are the judges going to evaluate with a rubric? Yes, the rubric will be, will really be hundred percent aligned with twenty first century learning design that Tracy we're gonna gonna walk you through on the January and the February call. Okay, thank you. Sure. I think with this, we're going to need to um, end the call. Um, so thank you, everyone, for attending the call. There are a uh, few last questions in the, uh, the Q&A pane. I will go ahead and answer them um, privately. But I'll hand it to you, uh, Heather, to just um, um, uh, end the call. All right, thank you so much, Razan and Tracy, for your presentations today. Ladies and gentlemen, I do want to thank you for all of your great questions as well. And just a reminder that you can down, download the handout uh, up in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. It's the icon that looks like three white sheets of paper. And with that, thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you on the call in January. Thank you.